I invite you to relax and get comfortable. Join me in this discussion of Just Another Theory. Thank you for joining me on Just Another Theory podcast where you can relax and we talk about true crime. Welcome to part two of the State of Wisconsin Respondent versus Stephen A. Avery Petitioner. Notice of motion and third motion for post-conviction relief pursuant to Wisconsin statute 874.06 and 805.15. Roman numeral two, Brady violation read the Solinsky evidence. Number 79. The Solinsky evidence is not only newly discovered evidence, but it also meets the criteria for a Brady violation. Number 80. After Mr. Solinsky contacted Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel and provided the newly discovered evidence, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel, through its investigator, submitted its second public records request pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act for audio recordings of incoming and outgoing phone calls and or radio dispatches between November 3, 2005 and November 9, 2005 that related to the Haubach case. The FOIA produced audio recordings did not contain the Solinsky call on November 6 at 10.28 p.m., nor did they contain any dates or times of the calls produced. Number 81. In May of 2022, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel received the previously suppressed Solinsky call to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office, which contained a partial recording of the suppressed call to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office on November 6, 2005. For the first time, current post-conviction counsel received the exact dates and time of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office incoming calls. Attached and incorporated herein as Exhibit D is a track timestamp record from the disclosure provided in May of 2022. Number 82. As part of its further investigation, Mr. Avery's investigator interviewed Mr. Solinsky's ex-girlfriend, whom he had been dating at the time of the November 5, 2005 incident. Mr. Solinsky's ex-girlfriend, Devon Novak, corporated Mr. Solinsky's account of what he had witnessed and what he had relayed to law enforcement. Further, Ms. Novak recognized and identified Mr. Solinsky's voice on the recording played to her by the investigator of a call made to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office on November 6, 2005 at 10.28 p.m. Affidavit of Ms. Devon Novak is attached and incorporated herein as Exhibit E. Number 83. Mr. Avery's investigator also interviewed Mr. Solinsky again and played the same audio recording of the phone call that was made to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office on November 6, 2005 at 10.28 p.m. Mr. Solinsky identified his voice in the auto recording of the phone call from November 6, 2005. Supplemental affidavit of Mr. Thomas Solinsky is attached and incorporated herein as Exhibit F. Old timey truth train coming through. Number 84. The recording of Mr. Solinsky's call was never disclosed by the state to Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel prior to or during the trial. Pre-trial, trial defense counsel made two specific requests pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 971.23 for all exculpatory evidence and or information within the possession, knowledge, or control of the state, which would tend to negate the guilt of the defendant or which would tend to affect the weight or credibility of the evidence used against the defendant, including any inconsistent statements. A second request was made by Trial Defense Counsel for Brady material immediately before trial on January 18, 2007. Affidavits of Mr. Avery's Trial Defense Counsel, Mr. Dean Strain, and Mr. Jerome Buting are attached and incorporated herein as Group Exhibit G, including an attached exhibit of Trial Defense Counsel's July 24, 2006 letter to Prosecutor Kratz requesting all audio tapes. Applicable Law vs. Brady Number 85. In Brady, the Supreme Court held that the prosecution violates an accused constitutional right to due process of law by failing to disclose evidence favorable to the defense. This rule encompasses evidence known to police investigators but not to the prosecutor. 
To comply with Brady, the prosecutor has a duty to learn of favorable evidence known to other government actors, including the police. Brady's suppression occurs when the government fails to turn over evidence that is known only to police investigators and not to the prosecutor. Number 86. There can be a due process violation, quote, irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution. The prosecution's duty to disclose evidence favorable to the accused includes a duty to disclose impeachment evidence as well as exculpatory evidence. Number 87. To establish a Brady violation, a defendant must demonstrate that 1. The prosecution suppressed evidence. Number 2. The evidence was favorable to the defense. And number 3. The evidence was material to an issue at trial. Number 88. The state never disclosed the Solinsky evidence or the Solinsky call to Mr. Avery's current or past counsel. See Exhibit C, Group G. The Solinsky evidence is incorporated by the partial recording of his attempt to report the evidence to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office prior to his call being transferred. Number 90. There is no recording or law enforcement report of the remainder of Mr. Zelensky's call that Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel, through reasonable diligence, has been able to locate through its public records request. Number 91. In Banks v. Dratke, the United States Supreme Court instructed, quote, A rule thus declaring prosecutor may hide defendant must seek is not tenable in a system constitutionally bound to accord defendants due process. Number 92. Further, the Wisconsin Supreme Court in State v. Weyerski in 2019 had specifically rejected the imposition of a reasonable diligence standard on trial defense counsel. The Wisconsin Supreme Court specifically stated, This court has never analyzed a Brady claim through the lens of reasonable diligence, and we decline to adopt that requirement now due to its lack of grounding in Brady or other United States Supreme Court precedent. Number 93. The Weyerski Court specifically overruled prior Wisconsin cases which have imposed a requirement of exclusive possession or control of material evidence by the state. The court specifically stated, There is no express support in the United States Supreme Court's Brady jurisprudence for the limitation that only favorable material evidence in the exclusive possession and control of the state must be turned over to satisfy the due process obligations enunciated in Brady. This limitation further thwarts the purpose of the state's obligation under Brady to prevent the state from withholding favorable material evidence that, quote, helps shape the trial that bears heavily on the defendant and, quote, casts the prosecutor in the role of an architect of proceeding that does not comport with the standards of justice. We hereby overrule the holding set forth in Nelson and its progeny that favorable material evidence is only suppressed under Brady, where the withheld evidence is in the state's exclusive possession and control. Number 94. There is no duty for the defense to seek out information that has not been disclosed. However, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel has made diligent efforts to obtain any and all information regarding the Solinsky evidence, including re-requesting all incoming calls to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office for the relevant time period. Number 95. The following timeline illustrates the diligence demonstrated by Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel in investigating and cooperating the evidence that Mr. Zelensky provided to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office on November 6, 2005. December 26, 2020, at 10.42 p.m. Mr. Zelensky emailed Stephen Avery's lawyer at gmail.com a summary of what he had observed on November 5, 2005. The subject line of his email was, We Need to Talk. Investigation of Thomas Zelensky's Credibility Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel conducted an investigation of Mr. Zelensky, which included gathering information about the following, his date of birth, relatives, employment history, telephone number, email addresses, possible criminal record, possible civil record, and car and home ownership. Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel confirmed that Mr. Solinsky had worked for the Manitowoc Herald Times during the relevant time period. 
financial documents dating 2005-2006, as well as newspaper articles from 2005-2006, listed Mr. Selinsky as a paper carrier for the Manitowoc Herald Times. Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel contacted Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel, Mr. Puting, who confirmed that Mr. Avery's trial counsel had not received any emails from Mr. Selinsky. Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel reviewed all discovery and FOIA requests made by prior counsel and current post-conviction counsel to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office. Any information relating to the Selinsky evidence was encompassed within those reports and should have been produced, but was not. April 7, 2021, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel sent and delivered a letter to Mr. Selinsky through a local investigator in Denver, Colorado, where Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel determined that Mr. Selinsky resided, requesting that Mr. Selinsky contact Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel office immediately. April 8, 2021, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel and her clerks had telephone contact with Mr. Selinsky and arranged a time to speak with him further. April 9, 2021, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel and clerks conducted a phone interview of Mr. Selinsky. Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel prepared an affidavit for Mr. Selinsky based on the statements in that interview. Mr. Zelensky indicated that he was going to be visiting family in Manitowoc on April 10, 2021. April 10, 2021, Post-Conviction Counsel's Investigator Stephen Kirby met with Mr. Zelensky in person in Manitowoc for an interview and reviewed his affidavit with him. The affidavit described the evidence Mr. Zelensky reported to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office about what he observed on the Avery property while delivering newspapers on November 5th. 2005, as well as the actions he took afterwards. His affidavit included a map indicating where he observed the two males pushing the RAV4. After receiving his affidavit and making any necessary changes, Mr. Zelensky executed the affidavit before a Wisconsin notary. April 12, 2021, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel filed defendant applicant's motion to stay, appeal, and remand the cause to supplement his post-conviction motion with a new witness affidavit establishing a Brady violation and a new third-party Denny suspect. April 28, 2021, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel listened to all audio recordings in its possession from Discovery as well as its own investigation and determined there was no recording matching the description Mr. Zelensky provided to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office. March 15, 2022, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel, through its investigators, submitted the following three new public records requests to the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. The first request sought copies of any non-911 recordings in your possession of incoming telephone calls to the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Joint Dispatch Center between the dates of November 3, 2005 at 12.01 a.m., through November 9, 2005, at 11.59 p.m. The second request sought copies of incoming and outgoing telephone call logs of the recorded Manitowoc County Sheriff's Joint Dispatch calls between the dates of November 3, 2005, 12.01 a.m. through November 9, 2005, 11.59 p.m. that relate to the Teresa Halbach investigation. Information should include date, time, and telephone numbers involved in the calls. The third request sought copies of audio recordings of incoming and outgoing calls and or radio dispatch between the dates of November 3rd, 2005 at 12.01 p.m. through November 9, 2005, 11.59 p.m. that relate to the Teresa Halbach investigation. May 3rd, 2022, in response to Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel's March 15, 2022 public records request through its investigator for the first time. Recordings were provided to Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel, who thoroughly reviewed and listened to all the audio recordings and located one of interest, which took place on November 6, 2005, at 10.28 p.m. For the first time, the time and date of the calls were revealed on the tracks filed. See Exhibit D. August 6, 2022. Current post-conviction counsel's investigator Stephen Kirby met with Mr. Zelensky's former girlfriend, 
Miss Novak, on August 6, 2022, and played for her the audio recording from November 6, 2005 at 1028 p.m. Miss Novak identified the voice on the call as Mr. Zelensky's. Ms. Novak provided Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel with an affidavit regarding her voice identification and her recollection of being with Mr. Zelensky when he placed the November 6 call to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office. See Exhibit E. August 6, 2022. Current post-conviction counsel investigator Stephen Kirby met with Mr. Zelensky and played for him the audio recording from November 6, 2005 at 1028 p.m. Mr. Zawinski identified the voice on the call as his. Mr. Zawinski provided Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel with an affidavit regarding his voice identification. See Exhibit F. Number 96, as stated above. After a very thorough investigation of Mr. Zawinski's individually and of the accuracy of the information he provided at the Zawinski evidence, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel determined that Zawinski's evidence necessitates filing a third 974.06 motion. Number 97. In order for the defendant to prevail on a third component of the Brady analysis, the suppressed evidence must be material. See State v. Harris. Quote, the evidence is material only if there is a reasonable probability that had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceedings would have been different. Number 98. In Kyles v. Whitley, the court noted, quote, The question is not whether the defendant would, more likely than not, have received a different verdict with the evidence, but whether, in its absence, he received a fair trial, understood as a trial resulting in a verdict worthy of confidence. A reasonable probability is lower than a preponderance of evidence standard. It is demonstrated where the defense shows that the failure, quote, undermines confidence in the conviction. Youngblood v. West Virginia. Number 99. Mr. Avery's conviction for first-degree intentional homicide was, in large part, based on trial defense counsel's unsuccessful efforts to name a third party, Denny suspect, that met all of the Denny requirements. Mr. Solinsky's evidence meets the Denny requirements and makes Bobby a third-party Denny suspect in the murder of Miss Halbach. Also, the Solinsky evidence meets the Denny requirements for establishing Bobby as having framed Mr. Avery for the murder. Bobby's possession of Miss Halbach's vehicle gave him access and opportunity to plant Mr. Avery's blood and DNA and to remove evidence from the vehicle and plant it in Mr. Avery's bedroom. Ms. Halbach's key, and the burn barrel, Ms. Halbach's electronic devices. The Solinsky new and material evidence was suppressed when the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office failed to disclose the November 6, 2005, 10.28 p.m. audio recording pursuant to defense discovery requests. The disclosure of the audio recording would have led to the identification of Mr. Solinsky and the evidence he has provided which directly connects Bobby to the murder and the framing of Mr. Avery. The Solinsky evidence is both material and favorable to Mr. Avery's case. 100. The Solinsky evidence is material because it makes Bobby a third-party Denny suspect in the murder as well as the source of the planted evidence that was used to convict Mr. Avery. The Solinsky evidence also impeaches Bobby's testimony and refutes the state's theory that Mrs. Halbach's rap 4 never left the Avery property and that Mr. Avery was the last person to see Ms. Halbach alive. Further, materially favorable evidence not only includes exculpatory evidence, but also evidence that is impeaching of a prosecution witness. Evidence tending to demonstrate the lack of credibility of a prosecution witness is material, especially when the prosecution's case depends on the credibility of that witness. Number 101. Bobby was the state's primary witness against Mr. Avery at his trial. During his opening statement, Prosecutor Kratz explicitly informed the jury of the significance of Bobby's punitive observations on the date of Ms. Halbach's disappearance. Quote, you are going to hear that Bobby Dassey was the last person, the last citizen that will have seen Teresa Halbach alive. Bobby testified that he observed Ms. Halbach's vehicle pull up in his driveway at 2.30 p.m. on October 31, 2005. Bobby then observed Ms. Halbach exit her vehicle and start taking pictures of his mom's maroon van right in front of his trailer. 
Bobby testified that he observed Miss Halbach walking towards the door of Mr. Avery's trailer. He testified that he never saw her again after that. He then testified that he took a three- or four-minute shower and then left his trailer to go hunting. Bobby walked to a Chevy Blazer, which was parked between the trailer and garage. He testified that as he walked to his vehicle, he observed Mrs. Halbach's vehicle still parked in the driveway. He further testified that he did not see Miss Halbach or any signs of her. Number 102. Contrary to Bobby's trial testimony that Miss Halbach was still on the Avery property when Bobby left to go bow hunting, Brian, Bobby's brother, told law enforcement that Bobby saw Miss Halbach leave the Avery property on October 31, 2005. On November 6, 2005, special agents with the Wisconsin DOJ Division of Criminal Investigation interviewed Brian. When the investigators asked Brian about the events of October 31, 2005, he told the investigators that he was not home during the day other than waking up and going to work. He told the investigators the following. Brian said he heard from his mom and Stephen that Halbach was only at their residence about five minutes. He heard she just took the photo of the van and left. Brian said the investigators should also talk to his brother Bobby because he saw her leave their property. The state was in possession of this report at the time of Mr. Avery's trial. Despite knowing this information, the state presented false testimony from Bobby. Number 103. On October 16, 2017, Brian provided current post-conviction counsel with an affidavit confirming that Bobby told him he saw Ms. Halbach leave the Avery property on October 31, 2005. In his affidavit, Brian stated as follows. On or about November 4, 2005, I returned to my mother's trailer to retrieve some clothes and I had a conversation with my brother Bobby about Teresa Halbach. I distinctly remember Bobby telling me, Stephen could not have killed her because I saw her leave the property on October 31st, 2005. Brian provided Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel with this affidavit after Mr. Avery's second post-conviction motion was filed and the circuit court ruled on it. Affidavit of Brian Dassey. Number 104. The appellate court highlighted the importance of the Zawinski evidence when it stated the following in its July 28th 2021 opinion. To admit evidence at trial that Dassey could have killed Halbach, Avery would have had to provide some evidence at the pretrial Denny hearing, directly connecting Dassey to the crime. See State v. Scheidel. Evidence that another party committed the crime may be admissible pursuant to Denny if the defendant can show, number one, the third party's motive, number two, the third party's opportunity to commit the crime, and Number three, some evidence directly connecting the third party to the crime. That Dassey possibly possessed violent pornography images might have conceivably satisfied a separate requirement motive, but it is insufficient in and of itself to allow admission of third party liability evidence. CID Avery failed to meet the direct connection required in his original Denny motion and has not presented additional evidence on this point in motion number four. While the appellate court determined that Mr. Avery did not have sufficient evidence to meet the Denny requirements to admit evidence at trial that Bobby could have killed Miss Halbach, it also advised that the Sawinski evidence could be that missing, quote, direct connection. Number 105. Because the Sawinski evidence was suppressed, trial defense counsel was not able to establish Bobby as a third-party Denny suspect or impeach Bobby's trial testimony as the state's primary witness. As a result, Mr. Avery did not receive a fair trial. Mr. Avery had a constitutional guaranteed right to present a complete defense to the charges against him. Number 106. Prior to the discovery of the Solinsky evidence, the appellate court stated that impeaching Bobby would not have undermined the cumulative effect of the significance forensic, and other evidence implicating Avery in a crime committed on his property. However, the discovery of the Solinsky evidence transforms this evidence from implicating Mr. Avery to implicating Bobby in the murder and planting evidence to frame Mr. Avery. 
even if this court determines that the evidence, quote, implicating Mr. Avery remains significant, it is unconstitutional to refuse to allow a defendant to present a defense simply because the evidence against him is overwhelming. Because of the existence of the new Sawinski evidence, Mr. Avery must be allowed to present a defense based upon it. Number 107. A reasonable probability of a different result exists if the suppressed information undermines confidence in the verdict. The suppressed Sawinski call undermines confidence in Mr. Avery's verdict. Its disclosure would have led to the discovery of the Swinsky evidence, which establishes Bobby as a third-party Denny suspect in both the murder and planting of evidence to frame Mr. Avery. It also impeaches Bobby's trial testimony, which he fabricated in order to exculpate himself and frame Mr. Avery for the murder of Miss Halbach. Mr. Avery is not procedurally barred from raising his Brady claim. Number 108 a motion for relief under 974.06 is a part of the original criminal action and may be made at any time. Wisconsin Statute 974.06. However, a defendant must meet certain requirements. All grounds for relief available to a person under this section must be raised in his or her original supplemental or amended motion. Any ground finally adjudicated or not raised or knowingly voluntarily or intelligently waived in the proceeding that resulted in the conviction or sentence or in any other proceeding the person has taken to secure relief may not be the basis for a subsequent motion unless the court finds a ground for relief asserted which for sufficient reason was not asserted or was inadequately raised in the original supplement or amended motion Number 109. In State v. Escalona, Novara, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that any claim that could have been raised on direct appeal or in previous Wisconsin statute 974.06 post-conviction motion is barred from being raised in the subsequent 974.06 post-conviction motion, absent a sufficient reason. The Escalona Naranjo Doctrine provides that a ground for relief raised by the defendant in a later filed 974.06 motion may be summarily denied by the trial court in its discretion without decision on merits of the claim if the ground for relief could have or should have been raised in the original supplemental or amended 974.06 motion. Number 110. In the context of a 974.06 motion, the defendant must describe with specificity his or her sufficient reason for failing to raise a claim in any earlier proceeding. That is, the defendant must show why his or her claim is not procedurally barred under 974.06. Number 111. On April 12, 2021, Mr. Avery filed the Solinsky motion to stay his appeal and remand for evaluation of a new claim. The appellate court determined that, quote, the circuit court should resolve on a standalone basis the Zolinsky motion through a new Wisconsin Statute 974.06 motion. The appellate court also stated that, pursuant to Escalana Navarria, Avery will need to demonstrate why he could not have previously raised his claim, including in his June 2017 motion, before the merits can be reached. Number 112. Current post-conviction counsel could not have brought the Solinsky motion filed with the appellate court prior to April 12, 2021, and the current motion prior to May of 2022. Therefore, the motions could not have been filed in any prior proceeding, including the filing of the June 2017 second post-conviction motion. The Solinsky evidence relayed by Mr. Solinsky to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office was never provided to Mr. Avery's prior counsel by the state. The Solinsky evidence was only discovered by Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel after being alerted to its existence by Mr. Solinsky in December of 2020. Current post-conviction counsel had to then thoroughly investigate and cooperate Mr. Zelensky and the Zelensky evidence. As paragraph 83 above illustrates, Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel was diligent in investigating and cooperating Mr. Zelensky and the Zelensky evidence. Number 113. 
The Solinsky evidence provided to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office on November 6, 2005, was unknown to Mr. Avery and undiscoverable at the time of Mr. Avery's 2017 post-conviction motion, 2013 post-conviction motion, direct appeal, and 2007 trial. It could not have been known or discovered by Mr. Avery because Mr. Zielinski had not come forward to Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel until April of 2021, and the state had suppressed the audio recording of his November 6, 2005 phone call to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office reporting his observations on November 5, 2005. Number 114. Therefore, the Zawinski evidence was unknown at the time of Mr. Avery's conviction, was not discoverable by reasonable diligence, and was not under the control or knowledge of Mr. Avery at any time prior to Mr. Zawinski contacting Mr. Avery's current post-conviction counsel in December of 2020. Number 115. It is an axiomatic that the discovery of the Brady violation subsequent to filing a motion pursuant to 974.02 or 974.06 constitutes a sufficient reason for failing to raise the issue in a prior motion. See State v. Allen, 2010, noting a defendant's unawareness of the legal basis of his claim may constitute a sufficient reason in satisfaction of 974.06. See also state example REL Kyles v. Poland, 2014. The defendant's unawareness of the factual basis of his claim was inextricable, intertwined with the legal basis of his claim. Number 116. Even if the courts determines there is not a Brady violation, the Zelensky evidence qualifies as newly discovered evidence as described above. Mr. Avery has a sufficient reason for not having brought forth the newly discovered evidence because Mr. Avery did not know and could not have known about the Zelensky evidence until Mr. Zelensky came forward in December of 2020 after Mr. Avery's appeal was pending. Number 117. Therefore, this court should find that Mr. Avery is not procedurally barred from raising his newly discovered evidence claim or his new Brady claim regarding the Zawinski evidence. Roman numeral 3. A second Brady violation, re Hobox Rab 4. Number 118. Kevin Ramlow, Mr. Ramlow, came forth to Mr. Avery's current post conviction counsel with new information on July of 2017. Mr. Ramlow provided an affidavit and supplemental affidavit to current post-conviction counsel because Mr. Avery's second post-conviction motion was filed in June of 2017. These affidavits were filed in Mr. Avery's motion to reconsider the circuit court's October 2017 ruling denying his second post-conviction motion. Number 119. In Mr. Ramlow's affidavits, Mr. Ramlow described observing Mrs. Hobox Rab 4 parked at the turnaround at State Highway 147 and the East Twin River Bridge on November 3rd and 4th, 2005. Mr. Ramlow describes in his affidavit reporting his observation to a Manitowoc Sheriff deputy he encountered on November 4th, 2005 at the Cynic Station on State Highway 147 in Mishcott. No law enforcement report was ever generated by this Manitowoc Sheriff deputy memorializing the conversation between Mr. Ramlow and this deputy. Number 120. Mr. Ramlow's observation of Mrs. Halbach's Rap 4 on November 3rd and November 4th, 2005, is material to trial defense counsel's theory that evidence was planted to frame Mr. Avery. If the Rap 4 was spotted at the turnaround on Highway 147 on November 3rd and 4th, 2005, then it must have been moved and planted on the Avery property before it was discovered on November 5, 2005. Clearly, this information supports trial defense counsel's theory that the rap floor was planted on the Avery salvage yard before it was discovered there on November 5, 2005. Mr. Ramlow's observations on November 3rd and 4th, 2005 of the Hobach vehicle at the turnabout off of State Highway 147 is cooperative of Mr. Solinsky's observation of the RAV4 being pushed down Avery Road, which directly intersects State Highway 147 in the early morning hours of November 5, 2005. Both witnesses support trial defense theories that the RAV4 was planted.
Number 121. Prosecutor Kratz admitted in his closing that the RAV4, quote, couldn't be driven into that property unless someone knew that property. The only other evidence presented by the state that the RAV4 never left the Avery property after October 31st, 2005, was Bobby's testimony that the RAV4 was still present when he left the Avery property at 2.45 p.m. Number 122. Trial Defense Counsel had no evidence from witnesses that the RAV4 was planted and simply argued in the closing that there were, quote, lots of ways to get in and for someone to plant the vehicle. Mr. Avery is not procedurally barred from raising his Brady claim. Number 123. In the appellate court's July 2021 opinion, the appellate court noted that in Mr. Avery's motion for reconsideration, he raised the issue that, quote, the state withheld evidence that Halbach's vehicle was seen on the streets days after her disappearance. Note, the appellate court declined ruling on this issue and advised the following. Neither we nor the circuit court have squarely considered whether these claims are procedurally barred under Escalona Navarra and whether Avery pled sufficient material facts entitling him to a hearing, although our analysis overlaps with the former inquiry. Such consideration would have to come on a separately filed Wisconsin Statute 974.06 motion, and we express no opinion as to whether such claims would be barred in the event such a motion is filed. Number 124. Clearly, current post-conviction counsel could not have included Mr. Ramlow's affidavits in its June 7, 2017 filing on behalf of Mr. Avery, since Mr. Ramlow had not yet come forward with evidence that establishes a Brady violation. There is no way that Mr. Ramlow could have been discovered by prior defense counsel or current post-conviction counsel because no law enforcement reports were prepared about his conversation with the Manitowoc Sheriff Deputy, nor did he appear in any other law enforcement reports in the Halbach murder investigation. He had never been a customer at the Avery Salvage Yard, and he had had no connection to the family besides being acquainted with Mr. Tadich's brother. Number 125. Mr. Avery was unable to discover the Brady violation with reasonable diligence prior to the filing of his second post-conviction motion in June of 2017 because Mr. Ramlow did not come forward to Mr. Avery's counsel until after June of 2017. It would be impossible for Mr. Avery to have raised his Brady claim without Mr. Ramlow first coming forward to current post-conviction counsel. Number 126. Therefore, Mr. Avery has a sufficient reason for not raising the issue previously pursuant to Escalana Navarro. In the alternative, Mr. Avery is entitled to a new trial in the interest of justice pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 805.15. Number 127. Alternatively, Mr. Avery is entitled to a new trial in the interest of justice. If this court were to conclude that this new evidence warrants a new trial in the interest of justice, this court need not resolve whether the new evidence satisfies a test for granting a new trial based upon newly discovered evidence. Number 128. Wisconsin Statute 805.15 establishes that the standard for granting a new trial under circumstances such as these is whether the new trial would advance the interest of justice. Quote, a party may move to set aside a verdict and for a new trial because of errors in the trial or because the verdict is contrary to law of the weight of evidence or because of excessive or inadequate damages or because of newly discovered evidence or in the interest of justice. Number 129. Courts may grant a new trial in the interest of justice whenever either, number one, the real controversy was not fully tried, or number two, it is probable that justice was for any reason miscarried. State v. X. In the first circumstance, when the real controversy has not been fully tried, the court may grant a new trial without considering whether the outcome would probably be different on retrial. Number 130. The Wisconsin Supreme Court has established the new evidence can provide the basis for a new trial in the interest of justice. In State v. Armstrong, the court ordered a new trial in the interest of justice because new DNA tests established that biological evidence asserted by the state at trial as having come from Armstrong could not have come from him. 
because, quote, the jury was not given an opportunity to hear important testimony that bore on an important issue in the case. The court found that, quote, the real controversy was not fully tried and thus ordered a new trial. See also Hicks, 202 Wisconsin. The new trial was necessary in the interest of justice because the jury did not hear important DNA evidence and heard evidence which was later shown to be inconsistent with the DNA evidence. Similarly, in Garcia v. State, the court ordered a new trial because of all the material evidence was not presented to the jury and, quote, the integrity of our system should afford a jury the opportunity to hear and evaluate the evidence. Number 131. As argued above, the new Zelensky and Ramlow evidence is material and needs to be presented to a jury. The evidence refutes the state's theory that there were no third-party suspects and no evidence was planted to frame Mr. Avery. The jury never heard this evidence and heard evidence that has now been refuted by the new evidence. An evidentiary hearing is required. Number 132. The circuit court must hold a hearing when the defendant has made a legally sufficient post-conviction motion and has the discretion to grant or deny an evidentiary hearing, even when the post-conviction motion is legally insufficient. Number 133. The Wisconsin Supreme Court in State v. Allen determined that the motion contains sufficient material facts for an evidentiary hearing if it includes, quote, the name of a witness who, the reason the witness is important, why, how, and the facts that can be proven, what, where, when, and would entitle a defendant to a hearing. Number 134. Mr. Avery has sufficiently pled the name of the witness, Mr. Zelensky, and the reason Mr. Zelensky is important. He provides evidence material and favorable to Mr. Avery by directly connecting Bobby to the Hawbach murders as a third-party suspect and connecting Bobby to planting evidence to frame Mr. Avery. All cooperating materials have been identified, attached, and incorporated into this motion affidavits, law enforcement reports, trial testimony. These cooperating materials demonstrate that Bobby is a third-party Denny suspect because he had motive, opportunity, and is directly linked to Mrs. Halbach's murder. Additionally, he is a Denny suspect who is directly linked to planting evidence to frame Mr. Avery by having access to key evidence of the crime because of his possession of the Halbach vehicle. Additionally, a new Brady violation has been identified as described previously in this motion. Number 135. Similarly, Mr. Avery has sufficiently pled the name of the witness, Mr. Romlow, and the reason Mr. Romlow is important, he provided evident material and favorable to Mr. Avery that refutes the state's theory and impeaches Bobby that the Halbach vehicle never left Avery property. Also, Mr. Romlow describes a new Brady violation. A law enforcement report was never made of Mr. Romlow's conversation with the Manitowoc Sheriff Deputy on November 4, 2005, about Romlow spotting the RAV4 in a location away from the Avery property. If trial defense counsel had had this information, they would have been able to refute the state's theory and impeach Bobby. Number 136. The Zawinski and Ramlow evidence would have been material and favorable to trial defense counsel because it would have undermined confidence in the verdict. Because of the suppression of this evidence, Mr. Avery did not receive a fair trial. Mr. Avery had a constitutional guaranteed right to present a complete defense to the charges against him. Number 137. If this court is disinclined to believe the Zawinski or Ramla new evidence, the court must hold a hearing before making any credible determination. Conclusion Mr. Avery respectfully requests this court grant him one of the following alternative remedies. Number 1. Order the state to file a response to the third motion for post-conviction relief and or grant an evidentiary hearing. Number two, grant this motion for prose conviction relief by ordering a new trial. Number three, grant the request relief and grant any and all relief this court deems appropriate. Dated this 16th day of August 2022. Respectfully submitted, Kathleen T. Zellner, Stephen G. Richards. Wow, that was absolutely one of the most incredible documents I have ever read in my entire life. Very well done. 
hats off to the Zellner team. You guys nailed it. I can't wait to see what comes next. Thank you guys for joining me every time and any time that you join me on Just Another Theory. If you enjoyed this, hit that like button, subscribe so that you know when I upload next. With that, I hope that you make your day count. I love ya to the moon and back.